hungry. We're hungry for more of you, Lord Jesus. And God, we confess this, that we need you. Each one of us here needs you. Oh God, we need you desperately, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord Jesus. Continue to be with us, Lord God, as we open up your word. We want to hear from you, Lord God. We want to hear from you. And Father, we ask this all in the name of our precious Savior, Jesus. Hallelujah. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. <laughs> Amen. Well, I want to tell you a little story. It's a little embarrassing, but I was just a little boy. Um, when I was, I think I was in the third grade, if I'm not mistaken, I was, uh, you know, I could get by with just the, what God gave me, but I wasn't very um, diligent in school at that time. Uh, and I remember I was, very, I was a procrastinator. Any procrastinators here? You, you left your homework to the last possible minute? That was me. So we had to do a composition, and uh, I had waited till the last minute. And as I sat there with the empty paper, nothing was coming. And I started to cry. And uh, just feeling sorry for myself. And my sister, who was two grades ahead of me and was a brainiac and a, st a studious and just hit the books and just was a totally opposite of me, she had compassion on me. So you know what she did? She wrote a composition for me. She wrote it on a blackboard, a whole composition. She did it for me. And after she was done, I looked at it, and I started to cry. You know why? Because I had to copy it <laughs> off the blackboard. I didn't even want to make the effort to copy what she had written on the paper, but I know she couldn't do it because the teacher would know it wasn't my handwriting. I want to talk to you about Going all out, which, of course, at that time I didn't. And there's a story in the Word of God. You may know it or may not. It's found in 2 Kings chapter 13. And it's about a, a king named Jehoash. I almost named my son Joey Jehoash then you would have called him Jehoi, for sure. <laughs> but this king was an evil king. He did wrong as many of, well, all of the kings of Israel, the northern ten tribes, all of the kings of the northern ten tribes were evil kings. Judah had evil kings, but they had around eight, I think, I'm not mistaken, about eight good and godly kings. The rest were ungodly kings. But Jehoash was an evil king, and he heard that Elisha was suffering and was on his deathbed. So we pick up the story in 2 Kings 13, 14 to 19. It reads like this. Now Elisha had been suffering from the illness from which he died. Jehoash, king of Israel, went down to see him and wept over him. My father, my father, he cried, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. Elisha said, get a bow and some arrows, and he did so. Take the bow in your hands, he said to the king of Israel. When he had taken it, Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. Open the east window, he said, and he opened it. Shoot, Elijah said, and he shot. The Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Aram. Elisha declared, you will completely destroy the Arameans at Aphek. Then he said, take the arrows, and the king took them. Elisha told him, strike the ground. He struck it three times and stopped. 
The man of God was angry with him and said, You should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it. But now you will defeat it only three times. Now the Arameans, the modern day Syrians, were a big problem for Israel. They attacked them a lot and subjugated the people. So we have Jehoash hearing that the prophet Elisha, who was a powerful man of God, was sick. And he made him scared. So we're going to uh, pull some lessons uh, before we pray today so that we can pray with effectiveness. How many want to pray with effectiveness tonight? I love praying, but what's the sense of praying if you're not going to pray the way that God hears prayers and with effectiveness so that God will send the answers to our prayers? How many say amen? The first lesson that I see from this uh, uh, passage of Scripture is that you need to know Jesus for yourself. As I opened up and said, King Jehoash was an evil king. And it says in verse 14, Now Elisha had been suffering from the illness from which he died. Jehoash, king of Israel, went down to see him and wept over him. My father, my father, he cried, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. Of course, Jehoash was concerned about himself. You have to know Jesus for the relationship and not for selfish gain. Jehoash is crying out, oh, the chariots, the horsemen of Israel, not, oh, you're dying. Not, I love you and I'm going to miss you. But uh, 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 Elisha knew God and the power of God was with him. Jehoash did not know God and the power of God was not with him and he knew it. But you think he wanted to turn to God? He was just concerned that this man of God who God used to protect Israel in so many instances, was now dying. So what was he going to do? He knew Elisha was connected to the power of God, and he wasn't. He was only concerned about himself. He was concerned about losing his kingdom. Some people only want God for what they can get out of him. You know, uh, when my wife and I used to do the marriage ministry over at Church of the Redeemer, that's what got us here to Maryland in the first place, um, there were couples that would come to our marriage meetings, our marriage classes, just to get their marriage fixed. And I would open up every session that we had and say this, if you're here just to fix your marriage, you're in the wrong place. We're here to find out how to get closer to Jesus. Because if you get closer to Jesus, your marriage will come along for the ride. If you're there just to fix your marriage, then once you think it's fixed, you leave. The Lord, I mean. Because you're fixed now. How many know you're never fixed? How many know we need God's keeping power every single day? Everybody. Everybody. We just heard last week that great man of God, Dr. Charles Stanley, uh, went home to be with the Lord. That man was a faithful man of God. Every time you would put him on, you would hear Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He preached the pure, unadulterated word of God. But I heard uh, during the uh, memorial service for him how that man prayed and relied on God every single day. Even The people that you think, boy, that's a great man of God. Guess what? They're only a great man of God because they're serving a great God and God is doing great things through them. They're not great. The God they serve is great. And without God, they'd be nothing. Amen? 
There was a man like that in the book of Acts, a man named Simon the sorcerer, who did great uh, magic, whatever it was that he was doing, I don't know. But many considered him like a god. And he heard Philip went there to, in his area to preach the good news, and he was astounded, and P Philip did miracles, and, and this Simon the sorcerer, the Bible said that he got saved. And then Peter came, and he saw Peter doing great miracles, and we read in Acts 8, starting in verse 18, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given, the Holy Spirit at the laying on of Peter's hands, at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry, because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness, and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin." Simon didn't want to lay hands so that people will be filled with the Holy Spirit so that they can live for God and be testimonies of his great goodness and, and his love for others. He wanted it so that he would look good. He wanted his power so that people would look up to him. And that's what Jehoash was concerned about. He wasn't concerned about Elisha. He wasn't even concerned about Israel. He was concerned about his kingdom because he didn't know God for himself. So the lesson for us, we need to know God for ourselves. Have you ever been, or maybe you were mentored by somebody that uh, uh, was great in the kingdom of God, a, a man of God, a woman of God that poured into your life? Anybody here has something like that? I did. But at some point, you got to get it. You have to know this Jesus that they introduced you to. You can't rely on somebody else. How many say amen? You have to know Jesus for yourself. Here's the second lesson from this passage of Scripture. Whatever you do in the name of Jesus, go all out. Whatever you do in the name of Jesus, go all out. 2 Kings 13, 15 to 18, from what we read, it says, Elijah said, get a bow and some arrows, and he did so. Take the bow in your hands, he said to the king of Israel. When he had taken it, Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. This man of God laid his hands on the king's hands as he took those arrows. Open the east window, he said, and he opened it. Shoot, Elijah said, and he shot. The Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Aram. This was a symbol that God was going to give victory to that evil king because Elisha had prayed and declared it so. Elisha declared, you will completely destroy the Arameans at Aphek. Then he said, take the arrows. And the king took them. Elisha told him, strike the ground. He struck it three times and stopped. Let me tell you what's going on there. He shot an arrow. And he said, that represents victory over the Arameans. And he says, take the arrows, the whole quiver of them, and strike the ground. What he meant was shoot it, but shoot it at the ground. And the king be be began to shoot the arrows at the ground, and he did three arrows, and then he stopped. Now, while Elisha didn't tell him how many times to shoot, he said, take the arrows. Take all the arrows and shoot. That meant all the arrows. It's obvious that Jehoash didn't fully believe that what Elisha was telling him to do would really bring full victory. Because if he did, guess what? He would have asked for more arrows. Hey, I'm done with these. You got any more? But perhaps he felt dumb shooting the arrows at nothing but the ground and not aiming at something specific. Did God ever tell you to do something and it felt silly to you? It didn't seem to make sense and you thought, 
I'm going to look a little weird if I do this. Man, I, I, I've been in, in the services where the Lord just was downloading something th- to do which was out of the norm. You know, while we have some kind of form of service, you know what? God has the final say here. If he tells me to stop and do something, we will stop and do something. If he doesn't want me to preach, I will not preach. We'll go on the floor and we will praise him for the rest of the service if that's what he wants us to do. He's in charge, not us. And sometimes I feel him prompting me to do something out of the ordinary. My heart will start to beat and I'll say, is this really you, God? Because this is going to seem a little weird but if it's really you, then confirm it in my heart and I will do it. I will do it. And of course, when you obey the Lord and it's God prompting you, of course, then you see what it was that he wanted to do. How many know what I'm talking about? But Jehoash, not knowing God at all, perhaps he felt dumb shooting at nothing. So he shot three arrows and he stopped. You know, sometimes we prefer to do something tangible that makes sense to us rather than just have simple faith. I mean, tell me to do something that makes sense. Don't tell me to do something that why in the world would shooting an arrow into the ground mean that I'm going to have victory? Why would God lead Elisha to tell this king that? You know what? God's ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. Sometimes he just wants to see if you will simply obey the simple thing that he told you to do. Because if you can't obey a simple instruction like shooting an arrow into the ground, how can he trust you with something bigger and grander than that? Perhaps Jehoash just wasn't patient enough to do things God's way. Because God's way of getting from point A to point B is hardly ever in a straight line. Our interest is getting from one point to the next point. God's interest is the line in between. And sometimes he takes you around ways that you never thought of getting from point A to point B. It's not the way you would have come. Just look at the Israelites in the desert for 40 years. Obviously, it was because of their sin. But that trip should have taken no more than 10 days. And it took 40 years because of their disobedience. Colossians 3.23 tells us the following. Whatever you do, Work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. And by the way, not only what you do for the Lord, but the way you pray to the Lord. God does not honor half-heartedness. He does not listen to half-hearted prayers. Would you? Would you listen to a half-hearted request from your child? You know, there are things that my boys would ask me growing up, and a lot of them were an automatic no. And some were, well, let's see, But then there were some that were, let's see, that they were very, very, very persistent about. And if it wasn't something that was going to harm them, they would begin to break me down until I finally would get it for them. And I remember one time they were after a PlayStation. I don't, it was early on. I don't remember it was one or two. It was three. He remembers. And so we were playing tennis, and I was slaughtering both him and Timmy and enjoying it. 
And then I said, Joey wanted to play me. I said, you know what? I was feeling so confident because I was mushing and smushing him, roasting and toasting him. And I said, son, if you beat me this next game, I'm going to get you that PlayStation 3. Would you believe that something welled up in that boy? <laughs> and I don't know how he did it. He had never, ever beaten me in my life. He beat me that game. And I had to eat humble pie and buy him the PlayStation 3. It was <laughs> desperation. But guess what? If he would be half-hearted about it, or if he would have let me off the hook after that game, you know, Dad, it's okay. Guess what? I wouldn't have gotten it for him. God hears desperate prayers. God hears prayers from the heart. That's why it's so important the way we pray. Praying is, is not a good luck charm. Praying is not throwing up Words into the air and hoping that they stick somehow. You are talking to Almighty God who happens to be your Heavenly Father. And the way that you talk to Him uh, it matters. How many know that? You just can't pray without any guts or feeling or heart behind it. Listen to our example, okay? Listen to our example, Hebrews 5 verse 7. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petition with fervent cries and tears to the one that could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. The Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, he would pray with loud cries and tears fervently. And it says God would hear him because of that. What makes us think that we're going to pray a casual kind of flippant prayer and that God would even pay attention to that? You and I, the way that somebody asks us for things, react to the way that they ask. How many, how many are with me? If somebody is asking you something from their heart, it, it moves you to want to do something, but if somebody's just casually and flippantly asking you for something, you're like, uh, I don't think so. So whatever you do in the name of Jesus, including the prayers that we're going to pray tonight, let's go all out. How many say amen? Timmy, if you come. Finally, I want to say this. Whenever you move in obedience to Christ Jesus, move with faith and with zeal. In verse 19 of 2 Kings 13, it says, The man of God was angry with him and said, You should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it, but now you will defeat it only three times. And if you read on, Israel defeated the Arameans exactly three times, and then there was trouble after that. They could have completely destroyed the Arameans and never be bothered by them again. And I was thinking how many victories or full victories we've missed out on because instead of continuing to strike with the arrows, we stopped. We stopped before the full victory. We many times don't see full victory because of a lack of faith. How many of us have started praying for something and when the answer didn't come, relatively quick enough, we stop praying about that. How many have been guilty of that? I'm raising my hand, okay? I'm trying not to do that anymore. Uh, I'm learning, uh, you know, and I have this 
running conversation with God, when I bring to him the same thing that I've been praying for a long time, and I say, God, I'm doing this. I'm going to bother you. You told me to. You gave me the, the parable about the widow with the unjust judge, the unjust ruler. She wanted uh, uh, justice, and he didn't care about her or her situation. But the, just as Jesus is telling the story, she kept going back and going back and going back until she wore him out. And Jesus said that this unjust judge says, just to get her out of my hair, I don't care about her, but to get her out of my hair, I'm going to give her the justice she's looking for. And then he said, if that's the way the unjust judge reacts, how about your heavenly father who loves you? Have we missed out on victories that God wanted to give us? Because we weren't patient enough? Because we didn't persevere? Because we didn't keep on? Oh, I don't want to miss anything. How about you? Sometimes we miss or we have limited victory because of a lack of zeal. Maybe you have some faith, but you lack zeal. Just like I lack zeal to do my homework. Hebrews 6, 11 to 12 says this, we want each of you to show this same diligence, listen, to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what's been promised. How many know that God has made a lot of promises to us as his people? How many want to inherit those promises? Raise your hand if you want to inherit the promises. If you don't care about them, don't raise your hand. I want to. But how? Through perseverance. Diligence to the very end. Faith and patience, we will inherit the promises of God. You know why? Because victory comes according to your faith. We have the example of the blind men who heard that Jesus was in their vicinity. And we read in Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 27, as Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, have mercy on us, son of David. I want you to notice the exclamation point. You know what that exclamation point is telling me? That they weren't saying, have mercy on us, son of David. They were shouting, have mercy on us, son of David. Have they were following him, shouting this. Have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him and he asked them, do you believe that I am able to do this? And let me just stop right there. That's the question for all of us as we ask God for the petitions and requests. Do we believe that he is able to do what we're asking him to do? I don't believe Jehoaz believed it because he stopped shooting the arrows. He wasn't anybody who knew God anyway. The question for us is do we believe? It's amazing to me God's patience with us because many times we pray without even believing that God's going to do what we're asking. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You ever caught yourself? You're praying and you're asking, but eh, uh, a lot of doubts as to whether God will do it or not. Do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and say, said, according to your faith, let it be done to you. According to your faith. You know how huge those words are? According to your faith, 
it will be done to you. I was just listening to a testimony right before the service. Somebody prayed. They didn't even have enough time, but they prayed a prayer of faith. And guess what God did? He answered the prayer. He answered the prayer. It lifted up my heart, the heart of my wife as well. God is faithful, and he will move according to your faith. Victory comes according to your faith. And prayer is answered according to your faith. We're about to pray. One of the things that I don't have patience for as a former New Yorker and after visiting the great city of New York this weekend at a pastor's conference, I'm glad to say I'm a former New Yorker. <laughs> One of the things that I don't have is patience for nonsense or patience for things that aren't true. As we used to say in Brooklyn, if I want to hear stories, I'll go to the library. I don't have time to waste your time and mine meeting and bringing you out on a Tuesday night if I didn't believe with all my heart and soul and had evidence that when you pray in faith, believing for something, that God does it. How many can testify that you have personal evidence of things that God has done for you because you prayed in faith, believing? Raise your hand. As a matter of fact, stand as a testimony to the goodness of God. Can we give him glory? You may be seated. But because we're human beings, guess what we have? We have selective amnesia when the next trial or problem comes. We forget what God has done before. Maybe this next trial or trouble is bigger than the one that he brought you through before. I love that song that we just sang. We're fighting a battle. He's already won. How many say amen? Do you believe that? I don't know what he's doing most of the time, but I do what that song says. I remember what he's done. And I know how he's rescued me before. My whole life has been a rescue. As I look back, I don't have, I, I could even feel, I mean, I couldn't write it all down. It's too much of the mercy that God has had in my life. Anybody can testify like me that it's just too much to even you know, write it all down? But he does it according to our faith. So if we're going to pray, Tonight, let's pray. If we're going to believe tonight, let's believe. If we're going to ask, let's ask fervently. Let's ask with cries and tears with our whole heart. Because if we can't ask with our whole heart, then I don't know if we really want anything anyway. Amen. But I believe that we do. So I, I, I want to do um, some business with the Lord tonight. And what I want to do, I'm going to invite those of you that have requests of the Lord. I don't care if you've been praying a day or uh, a year or two years. I want to do business with God tonight. We're going to put God's word to the test. God's word always passes the test. I want to come up here, and I'm going to kneel at this altar. You can come and stand or kneel where you want, but I want you to do business with God for that thing that you've been asking him, that need that you have. We're going to come, and we're going to have faith, and we're going to pray from our hearts. And then when God brings the answer, we're going to give him glory. How many can, tell, can, can, can promise me that as God gives you 
the answer that you're going to give him glory. Could you raise your hand with me? So for the next few moments, I'm going to turn this microphone off and I'm going to kneel right here. I have things I need God to do for me and for uh, things in, in my life and in my family. And whoever wants to join me, come up here and just kneel or stand before the Lord. We're going to do business with God. And God's going to get glory from it as he brings us the answers. Amen? Amen. Come on up, those of you that want to believe God and pray with all of your heart.